Welcome to Cinema 5D on the Couch, the talk show with filmmakers and industry leaders. Brought to you by G Technology, Rode Microphones, Movidium, Film Convert, and FNV. Welcome to another episode of Cinema 5D on the Couch. Thanks to our sponsors, G Technology, Rode Microphones. Movidium.com, uh, Film Convert, and FNV. We are happy to welcome writer director Has. Hi. So Has, you started in the visual effects industry. I mean, that's what you still work in. Um, but you started with computer games, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was still at university, and um, obviously I wanted to make films. But you, there wasn't really any route to you know going to unless you went to film school, which I couldn't go to film school just for whatever reason. So, but I also love video games. I was a complete game junkie. Um, so I got an internship at a games company. And what I was doing in games company was I wasn't really making games. I was doing the cinematics. You know the stuff that says not game footage? That's stuff that I was doing. So there's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of camera movements, lighting, animation. So I was like a 3D generalist. I was doing animation, compositing. You know, back then there wasn't really any separate jobs. It's like, you're an artist, do it all. <laughs> Get it done. Which is Quite cool. It kind of reminded me kind of like what we have today with, with low-budget filmmaking. So I did that for several years and, um, you know, like, I don't know, flash forward, I'm a six years, five years time down the line. I had to choose which path to go because I wanted to work in film. And, I'm, and I was doing a lot of big CG type cinematic shots and, um, and I wanted to apply to work on film. So I sent my showreel out and I was getting rejections. Every visual effects company was like, no, no, sorry, you... That's not what we're looking for. I'm like, I don't understand. I'm compositing. I'm, what, what, I was, what the biggest mistake was, I was compositing CGI, which even though it's compositing, it's not really compositing. Compositing is when you take a live action shot, you take a CGI, you seamlessly blend it together. So I went away, while still working in game, did my own showreel, picked up a DV cam, start shooting stuff and doing my own composite, watching films and trying to mimic those sort of effects, send my reel back to the studios and I got my job. And ended up working on one of the first films I worked on was 10,000 BC, the Roland Emmerich film. So I did a lot of rotoscoping, compositing. And from there, I just rose up over the years, became a senior compositor, lead compositor, and then became a visual effects supervisor. And now I'm a VFX producer. But I'm still very much hands-on. But yeah, it's pretty much a journey. And it's that whole journey in visual effects is what kind of um, was my film school into making films. Cool. So you always intended making films, but yeah, your way into making films was basically, basically the visual effects route. Exactly. Rather than going to film school. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so then you ended up working on some bigger Hollywood productions as well. Yeah. Um, that's the joys of freelancing. Um, especially when you're working in, in Soho, in London Soho, where all the big facilities are. Um, you end up working on big films. And because of the nature of these big movies, you know, films like Batman or Hellboy or all the, all the other big films, they don't just come to one studio. Um, they get divided up from several studios. So even if you don't work for the big facilities like the frame stores or the NPCs, you work for a smaller company, which is what I end up doing, freelance at smaller companies, you still end up working on those big shows. Um, so yes, over the years, I picked up a few, um, my IMDb credit listing, grew, and my skills grew. And, um, but what's cool is working on a variety of movies. It wasn't just the big blockbuster movies I was working on. I was working on independent films, working on commercials, working on music promos. And even though it's all compositing and visual effects, um, there are different ways of doing things. Like for example, on a big film, I would have three months to do a shot. And you revise it and revise it. It'll take like 100 versions. Move that pixel left over there. No one's ever going to see it, but you know, the director sees it. It was on an independent movie. It's like, we only have this amount of time, this amount of budget. You're still going to make it look cool. And it's that approach is what I like. And you then went back or went into making your own films yeah, using um, that approach, right? Yeah, you, exactly that. Exactly that. Um, it was actually when I became a visual effects supervisor in about, I think, yeah, 2011, maybe 2012. Um, I became a visual effects supervisor um, at a company called Jellyfish Pictures. And I ended up supervising a show called America, The Story of Us. It is a massive documentary show in America. It's like one of the biggest selling shows for a history channel. Um, but there's a lot of dramatization, a lot of CGI. And I remember working with the directors and the directors couldn't really understand how to tell a story using a virtual camera because they were so good at the drama and live action. So I was left to doing that myself. And that's when I realized I could make movies because I'm working with executives. I'm dealing with the producers on a day-to-day -day basis as a VFX supervisor. I'm going on set on location, working with First AD, 
working the DOP, trying to figure out how we can get this shot made for so little money. Especially when you're working on broadcast, the money is so little, but yet the standards are super high. You know, the, you know, the studios, the TV studios always reference Hollywood films, but they don't have the Hollywood money. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's some honesty here, um, but, <laughs> but it's a reality. So because of all of those restrictions in my day job, it inspired me to make my films. And I wasn't afraid to make my films because I've been doing it with my day job. Mm, cool. So you could use everything you learned from there. Yeah, compositing, use of CG, how to shoot stuff smartly, types of cameras, working with a crew, which I felt was very important. Yeah, be able to help understand how to work your first AD, how to utilize your crew to the best way. Because you, know, you could end up having a massive crew and most of them standing around doing nothing. And I hate that. But what that was that, I mean, we come from a completely different side. You know, if we do something and want special effects, we're basically clueless and have to find out how to do it and, or have to f have find somebody who helps us doing that. Sure. Um, because we're all cameramen and, you know, yeah. come from the production side. So you come from the post-production side. Was it hard for you to actually get all the production st knowledge? Um, it was a little bit hard, yes. Mainly because everything I thought of, like, yeah, we could do it on the computer. Yeah, we can we can do it in CG or we'll we'll do it all on green screen, and um, and which was my first short film, Fubar Redux, which is the one the cats and dogs. That was my first short, and um, to be honest, I was quite naive. I thought I would do that and I'll get I'll get made into a director. Obviously, I didn't. Um, but it's a lesson learned, and because you can do everything on the computer, but there are some things you just can't get on the computer, and that's performance. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned making these short films is working with actors and working with a DP. I mean, I used to think, how can it be to pick up a camera and shoot something, right? But obviously there's a lot, there's, it, it's an art. It's nice to hear that from somebody <laughs> who comes from visual effects because very often, I mean, that's, a, you know, you know all these films who are, <laughs> have great effects and terrible acting. It's like they are made by people who sit in front of the computer all the time and don't really sure. relate to. No, sure, exactly. Yeah. But also working with a DP, you know, in order to get that, to get that shot that you want, you know, to, to use the right lens, you know, the right lighting, you know, the right time of day if you're shooting exterior. You know, these are all things we kind of overlook when we're doing stuff all on the computer. But on the flip side, what I have learned is when we do receive footage that is badly shot, then we suffer in post because then we can't key the shot because it's badly lit. Um, we can't do good rotoscoping because the camera's moving all over the place with motion blur. So these are all the things I had back in my head. So when I'm shooting with my DP, I'm like, let's not move the camera too much because we're going to have to do tracking. Whereas if, you, if another director has never done visual effects, they'll go, yeah, move the camera. Let's go be Paul Greengrass. And, and it's a nightmare. So <laughs> you, having all of those experience, the good and the bad, is what helped me shoot my live action. Cool. So then you made another film, uh, Project Kronos. Project Kronos. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, so like I said, with Fubai Redux, I thought if I make an animated film, yeah, that's it. I can make it. And obviously... It was cool, but that's not what's going to get you to make films. So I was getting told by a lot of people, a lot of my close friends saying, listen, you, know, you really should do something with live action. Work with actors, work with a crew. I was, and I was like, oh man, that's too much hassle to go and get a camera, get some actors. God, but I thought I've got to do it. And I wanted to do something that I knew I could do for a small amount of time. Because bear in mind, I'm doing this while working in visual effects. And we all know visual effects isn't nine to five. It's, it's a lot of hours. Uh, so I still had to squeeze it in somehow. I also, at the same time as doing Project Kronos, I was already supervising documentary type um, dramas and documentary series for History, Discovery, and the BBC. So I was already in that frame of mind of documentary. But at the same time, I love science fiction. You know, I love the Neil Blomkamp stuff. I even love back, you know, the Steven Spielberg stuff. I love sci-fi. So I thought, it wouldn't be cool to take the whole documentary aspect, take this grounded sci-fi. We're not talking Star Wars here. We're talking grounded stuff. Stuff like you look at, is this real? That sort of thing. And my love for space travel and mix that up together. So, and I thought, well, I don't want to do CGI. I don't want to go and do big renders of planets and rockets. That's going to take me forever. Then I, you know, stumbled across NASA, the NASA website. Amazing. And I was like, this is great, this is great. And then I read the small print, you can actually use the footage for public domain. <laughs> But I thought, I'm still going to be nice. I'm going to email the guys and say, listen, I'm going to be doing this. Is it okay? 
and some representative from NASA then emailed from their JPL website, emailed me back their press office like weeks later. I said, hi, yeah, your idea sounds really cool. Um, you can use whatever you like as long as you don't use the NASA logo. I'm like, cool. So I go back and look at the footage that I've selected. They've all got the NASA logo. So I'm like, damn, what I do? And I thought, well, hang on, so I'm a compositor. <laughs> Paint the logo out and put my own logo on. And they were fine with that. So then I realized, that, so instead of going out and shooting all the space shots, I had all my footage already shot for me. And then any shots that I needed to do, I, I would then take an element from one footage, another footage, and combine it together. So this is using my compositing background to avoid doing CGI. Obviously, there is some CG in Kronos with a big probe. And, to, and for that, I got my friend in France, in Olivier, at Dwarf Labs in Montpellier. They said, listen, we can give you some CG time for free, but you know, we're really busy. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be very smart here. I've only got a week of these guys. I can't keep giving them loads of work to do. So I wanted, I, I designed a probe that everything was animated on it. And they rendered it 4K for me on, on an alpha, alpha transparency background. I then used that, scale it down, moved it around, and used it through the whole shot. And because everything was moving, it gave the optical illusion that I was animating it in Z depth, when really I wasn't. And it's all done After Effects, Adobe mm. CC. Um, so that's another use of CG, smartly use CG. Um, stock footage, people can relate to. And then I started getting actors on board. And that was a challenge, because my script was very technical. It's a nerdy, nerdy, geeky script. The actors I had on board, didn't really, were not that nerdy like me. So I spent weeks going to the coffee shop with these guys and talking about it. And I realized the best way to do it was give them the script and tell us, ask them, what, what is your reaction to what this scientist is saying? And you know, the idea of putting a brain in a capsule and sending it out in space. What do you, and someone go, that's ridiculous. And we use that. There's a scene in the film, Victor Perez, my good friend, he was going, it's the most ridiculous idea. He genuinely meant that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I used that. So that's kind of the skill I learned was roll with the actors, get the actors involved. And you end up collaborating with the actors rather than dictating to the actors. And that's something that I learned and I enjoy that process. Awesome. And I think that's what made Kronos the way it is because it had that believable factor in it. And that really took off, right, online? It went viral, mainly because everyone thought, some people thought it was real, did they really send things up there? And a lot of the NASA footage um, and the performances really helped. I think it helped with the performances. Yeah. And it landed you a feature film deal? It landed me a feature film deal. Um, the trailer came out last April, I think it was, yeah. Uh, it could happen so fast. Um, yeah, trailer came out. I was called up by several agents, several managers. And again, this is new to me. I had no idea, like, what do I do when an agent calls me? Do I go with this one? Do I go with that one? So I did some research. And um, one particular guy I went with, a guy called Scott Glassgold from I Am Entertainment. And um, let's get some water. He was, um, he was pretty cool because from the get-go, he was like, I love your project. I'm going to help you shape it. He hasn't even signed me on yet. And I looked at the roster of directors that he represents. Yeah, he represents some really good directors. If you go to IamSports.com, Scott Glasgow, you'll see. And all these directors have one thing in common. They're all visual effects guys turned directors. And they've all gone on to make movies for the big studios like Warner Brothers and Fox and so on. So I thought, I want to do that. So but obviously, it's, yeah, it's a relationship thing. So he came boy, shaped the trailer. And then we released the film at the end of April. Um, based on the feedback I got from Scott Glasgow, which was like an amazing feedback. Some of the stuff he suggested I would never have thought to put in there. Like, you know, maybe change the ending or, you know, change the beginning. And I was like, oh, really? But again, it's an education thing because that is how it is when you make movies. You're working with executives, you're working with feedback. And it's something I'm used to already in my day job. As You know, my day job as a VFX supervisor is I get constantly clients going, that doesn't look real, that looks crap, or make it more blue or that cloud is fake and i'm like no that cloud is real we shot that in camera <laughs> <laughs> so little things like that so i was used to that so um yeah and the film came out and it went viral and um, there was a bidding war and studios were bidding to f to you know option the film nice. and it went with a company called bender spink um they they're a really good company they did films like we're the millers they do other films as well and um and the finance company called armory films and that's it our finance company came on board, financial company, the production company, and Scott Glasgold. So that was the package. And then I had to write the thing. <laughs> is, is it finished? The writing? Yeah, the writing was, well, it took about, it took a while to write it, mainly because I'm a first time writer. So I had to ditch compositing and focus on writing. And um, so deal with words rather than the pixels. And um, 
it was hard because you know it was like hundreds of versions I wrote. Oh my god, lost count. But when they handed it into the studio, it's like version one. It's like oh my god. So, but now I can write. I can write for studios, and it, it's a muscle, right? The more you do it, the better yeah. you get it. Um, so that was delivered like a few months ago, and they've got another writer on board to help polish it. And we're at the stage of budgeting and casting. It's all really exciting. I'm going to LA mid October. Um, but while that's happening, I'm also doing other projects as well. Thanks for watching this segment of Cinema 5D on the couch. If you want to hear more from our guest, Has, please tune in for the next episode. And also thanks to our sponsors, G Technology, Rode Microphones, Movidium.com, Film Convert and F&V. Thanks for watching.